The Communist Manifesto is one of the most influential books of the last two centuries. At under 40 printed pages in length, it's also one of the shortest. The ideas are concentrated and it must be read accordingly. The purpose of this video is to provide an orientation to the basic ideas of the Communist Manifesto, to discuss the times during which the book was written, and to encourage you to read it. This is not a substitute for working through the Manifesto together with your comrades. Karl Marx once said, The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. To be effective in bringing about social change, people need to know something about human social structures and how they were transformed in history. Why? According to Sir Francis Bacon, a scientist and philosopher who lived at the time of Galileo, human knowledge and human power meet in one. For where the cause is not known, the effect cannot be produced. Nature to be commanded must be obeyed, and that which in contemplation is as the cause is an operation as the rule. By the same token, if knowledge is power, then those with political power have some incentive to conceal the scientific knowledge of history. James Madison was a Virginia slave owner who became the chief architect of the Constitution and the fourth president of the United States. In the years before the American Revolution, he was concerned about the impact of slave rebellions on the ability of the new country to survive a British onslaught. He took up this topic in a 1774 letter to his powerful Philadelphia friend, William Bradford. Rather than arguing for emancipation, the advice he gave regarding slave rebellions was this. It is prudent such attempts be concealed, as well as suppressed. And Section 31 of the Alabama Slave Code of 1833 made it illegal to teach enslaved people to read. The Communist Manifesto aims to put us in the know. It aims to tear away the concealment and to reveal to the working class how things got to be the way they are and how things might progress. In light of the fact that sound understanding and effective action are closely linked, the effort of studying the manifesto is repaid. This section concludes with a description of how the Communist Manifesto is organized. Then we'll move on to the three main parts. In Elements, we'll consider two things that are basic to the manifesto. First, the idea that motion is possible, although like ocean currents, one must look below the surface to discover what drives it. Secondly, socioeconomic classes, which are the basic elements of Marxian analysis. In the next part, dynamics, we'll look at how the elements interact. At the first level, different class interests are in constant conflict. Sometimes this conflict is veiled, at other times it's out in the open. At a larger scale, developments in economic production set the stage for decisive social changes. Part 3, Emerging, deals with working class self-awareness, or class consciousness, as it developed in history, beginning with a discussion about the times during which the manifesto was written. On opening the book, you will find it organized into five parts. The first part is a prologue of about two paragraphs. It begins, A specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. At the time, in the 1840s, a movement for voting rights, a shorter work week, and more took hold in the European working class. The ruling class tried to spread fear of this movement with accusations of communism. Marx defies this atmosphere of intimidation. It is high time, he writes, that communists should openly, in the face of the whole world, publish their views, their aims, their tendencies, and meet this nursery tale of the specter of communism with a manifesto of the party itself. The first substantive section of the book is entitled Bourgeois and Proletarians. It's devoted to explaining, in a dozen or so pages, its very first sentence. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. It contains a powerful summary of the historical development of what is called bourgeois society in the text, but which we usually call capitalism. Next is section two, proletarians and communists, which ends with the declaration, 
In place of the old bourgeois society with its classes and class antagonisms, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. Marx explains in this section that the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class to win the battle of democracy. Communists are defined here as an integral part of the working class consisting of its most resolute elements and allied with other working class institutions. Section 3, Socialist and Communist Literature, subjects to withering criticism early socialist and communist ideas that had been espoused before the conditions of class struggle under capitalism were reasonably well understood. While Marx and Engels always acknowledged their debt to earlier thinkers, they were concerned that left unchallenged, the immature ideas would prevent emergence of greater clarity within the developing movement. Section 4, Position of the Communists in Relation to the Various Existing Opposition Parties, reiterates a strategic policy of broad political alliances for the purpose of attaining the immediate aims of the working class, while taking care that prospects for the future of the class are not harmed, and pressing for more advanced positions. The book ends with the rallying cry, Working men of all countries unite. There is great cultural pressure to give up making change before even trying, to make you feel that you are just bound to lose. Commenting on this pervasive cultural pressure, the well-known singer Woody Guthrie once said, I hate a song that makes you think that you're not any good. I hate a song that makes you think that you're just born to lose bound to lose, no good to nobody, no good for nothing, because you're too old or too young or too fat or too slim, too ugly or too this or too that. Songs that run you down or poke fun at you on account of your bad luck or hard traveling. I'm out to fight these songs to my very last breath of air and my last drop of blood. I'm out to sing songs that will prove to you that this is your world and that if it has hit you pretty hard and knocked you for a dozen loops, no matter what color, what size you are, or how you're built, I'm out to sing the songs that make you take pride in yourself and in your work. And the songs that I sing are made up for the most part by all sorts of folks just about like you. I could hire out to the other side, the big money side, and get several dollars every week just to quit singing my own kind of songs and to sing the kind that knock you down still farther and the ones that poke fun at you even more and the ones that make you think you've not got any sense at all. But I decided a long time ago that I'd starve to death before I'd sing any such songs as that. The radio waves and your movies and your jukeboxes and your songbooks are already loaded down and running over with such no good songs as that anyhow. Woody Guthrie. For as long as there have been rulers, and those who are ruled, it has been argued that change is impossible, that you are bound to lose so you might as well just give up. It is a very old line. Very old, indeed. The video clip we're about to see presents Zeno's paradox from around 450 BC, which suggests that even the most basic sort of change, physical motion, is merely an illusion. By extension, if even physical motion is illusory, then there would be no point trying to bring about social change. You're just bound to lose. Zeno was a sophist. Sophists were educated people in ancient Greece who hired themselves out to wealthy patrons to help them make political arguments. Nowadays we'd call them spin doctors, and there are plenty of them, but none of today's spin doctors will be remembered for the two millennia we have remembered and admired Zeno's brilliance. So let's hear it from the other side. <clears throat> the tortoise challenged Achilles to a race claiming that he would win as long as Achilles gave him a small head start. Achilles laughed at this, for of course he was a mighty warrior and swift of foot, whereas the tortoise was heavy and slow. 
How big a head start do you need? He asked the tortoise with a smile. Ten meters, the latter replied. Achilles laughed louder than ever. You will surely lose, my friend, in that case, <laughs> he told the tortoise. But let us race, if you, if you wish it. On the contrary, said the tortoise. I will win, and I can prove it to you by a simple argument. Go on, then, Achilles replied, with less confidence than he felt before. He knew he was the superior athlete, but he also knew the tortoise had the superior wits, and he had lost many a bewildering argument with him before this. Suppose, began the tortoise, that you give me a ten-meter head start. Would you say that you could cover that ten meters between us very quickly? Very quickly, Achilles affirmed. And in that time, how far should I have gone, do you think? Perhaps a meter, no more, said Achilles, after a moment's thought. Very well, replied the tortoise. So now there is a meter between us, and you would catch up that distance very quickly? Very quickly indeed. And yet, in this time, I shall have gone a little way further, so that now you must catch that distance up, yes? Yes, said Achilles, slowly. And while you are doing so, I shall have gone a little way further, so that you must then catch up the new distance. The tortoise continued smoothly. Achilles said nothing. And so you see, in each moment you must be catching up the distance between us, and yet I, at the same time, will be adding a new distance, however small, for you to catch up again. Indeed it must be so, said Achilles wearily. And so you will never catch up, the tortoise concluded sympathetically. You are right as always, said Achilles, and conceded the race. Brilliant as Zeno's argument is, and as often as it has been recycled and retreaded and replayed, don't believe it. You know that Achilles can beat the tortoise. Some centuries after Zeno's day, with the development of natural science and mathematics, we can understand the laws of physical motion well enough to resolve the mystery of Zeno's paradox. The life forms inhabiting Earth, too, undergo change. With the relatively recent discovery of DNA, scientists have made great progress in clarifying the large-scale biological laws of motion, that is, the structure and mechanisms of evolution. Marx and Engels postulated that human productive activity has enormous power to structure and change the world around us, in particular the social world. Some continue to doubt this. But despite doubts expressed in the mainstream media, very few physical scientists now doubt, for example, the power of unplanned and unregulated human productive activity to cause dangerous changes in the structure of Earth's climate. Although this is a negative phenomenon, it is a confirmation of the general idea that the forces of production do have enormous capacity to structure the world around us. To overcome the idea that social change is impossible, we have to understand the laws of motion of history. History is not a mystery, but it does take some work to understand history and to make it. The only ones who are bound to lose are those who stand in the way of social progress. Here's what Woody says. Put a there, boy, and we'll show these fascists what a couple of hillbillies can do. In 1949, Paul Robeson made a concert tour of Europe. 
He was an acclaimed artist, son of a slave from eastern North Carolina who had managed to escape to his freedom and join the Union Army in the Civil War. In this brief video, we'll see Robeson singing the anthem of the then newly founded People's Republic of China. In the middle of the last century, a European audience responds warmly to an African American singing in Chinese. What makes it happen? This question brings us to the theme of class consciousness, which is what endowed Robeson's concert with that enthusiastic sense of international solidarity. Class consciousness is one of the many ways that individuals can develop shared perspectives based on shared experience. The overall point of the Communist Manifesto is to develop a class conscious politics within the working class. It will take some time to explain what that means. The women gathered at the time clock on the left work at a department store. On the right are some of the most powerful bankers in the United States. What is meant by class? Humans are not solitary beings. Rather, we enter into a wide array of relationships with each other. The social relationships in which we produce the continuing basis for human existence – food, clothing, shelter, education, and health care – are highly organized. These are economic relationships. The word economic derives from the Greek roots oikos for house and nomos for that which is assigned, or law. The general structure of economic relationships has been written into the law books ever since there have been law books. When Marx and Engels write about class, they do not refer to different levels of income, elegance, or personal sophistication, as is often done in mainstream writing. Marxists use the word class to refer to human relationships within the economic structures of work and property. Capitalism and the advent of the Industrial Revolution in the late 1700s completely transformed how masses of people participate in the economy. By the 1840s, as Frederick Engels wrote in one of the early drafts of the Communist Manifesto, two new classes have come into being, absorbing all other classes of society. They are, one, the class of the big capitalists who in all civilized countries are the almost exclusive owners of the means of subsistence and the raw materials and instruments, machinery, factories, etc., needed for the production of those means of subsistence. This is the class of the bourgeois, or the bourgeoisie. Two, the class of the totally dispossessed, who are compelled to sell their labor to the bourgeois in order to provide the necessary means of subsistence for themselves and their families. This class is called the class of the proletarians, or the proletariat. Proletariat and bourgeoisie are terms for classes that are borrowed from pre-capitalist societies. Their modern meanings, as Engels wrote, are working class and capitalist class. The Communist Manifesto is addressed to the working class. Where do the words bourgeois and proletarian come from? Proletarian is a term from ancient Rome that referred to a member of the lowest of the several classes of Roman citizen. Among the classes of Roman citizens, there were plebeians, who held some land, and patricians, who were nobles. Proletarians had no assets other than their offspring, which is the meaning of the Latin word proles. Bourgeois is a term from European feudal society that derives from the ancient Frankish word bourg, referring to dwellings within a fortified enclosure. The bourgeoisie emerged in Europe during the late Middle Ages. They were merchants, wealthy artisans, and moneylenders who lived in the cities that grew up next to the lands of the nobility. The bourgeoisie were not themselves nobles, 
but were propertied and had special rights as well as restrictions under feudal law. In the European revolutions of the 1700s, the feudal bourgeoisie transformed itself into the modern capitalist class, abolished feudal forms of property, and became the new ruling class. But you don't have to travel to Europe to find in the law books words for classes and different forms of property that have since been abolished. In a compromise with slave owners, the Constitution of the United States originally counted an enslaved person as three-fifths of a free person for purposes of representation, permitted the importation of slaves until 1808, and provided for the return of escaped slaves across state lines. The right to hold property in humans, and therefore the classes of slave owner and slave, were eliminated in the Civil War by emancipation and by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution soon after. The modern bourgeois society that has sprouted from the ruins of feudal society has not done away with class antagonisms. It has but established new classes, new conditions of oppression, new forms of struggle in place of the old ones. Our epoch, the epoch of the bourgeoisie, possesses, however, this distinctive feature. It has simplified the class antagonisms. Society as a whole is splitting up more and more into two great hostile camps into two great classes directly facing each other, bourgeoisie and proletariat. The words are from the manifesto. We return to Paul Robeson to end this section. Soon after the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott and the 1957 prayer pilgrimage for freedom, he wrote a book entitled Here I Stand. <laughs> spirit that our people have is intangible, but it is a great force that must be unleashed in the struggles of today. A spirit of steadfast determination, exaltation in the face of trials. It is the very soul of our people that have been formed through all the long and weary years of our march toward freedom. It is the deathless spirit of the Great Ones who've led our people in the past. Douglas, Tubman, and all the others. And of the millions who kept a inching along. That spirit lives in our people's songs. In the sublime grandeur of Deep River in the driving power of Jacob's Ladder, in the militancy of Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho, and in the poignant beauty of all our spirituals. One of our next guests, one of our the warmest, and at the same time, one of the most dynamic personalities I've ever met. When you hear her, you will understand why she is the world's greatest gospel singer, Miss Mahalia Jackson. You may talk about the man of Gideon. You may 
The manifesto challenges the naive but popular view of history as a pageant of generals and celebrities or as crusades behind various sentiments, chivalrous and otherwise. It is not the case that Marx believes that leadership, organizations, and ideas are unimportant. Rather, the point is to make the picture complete by bringing out the structure of the powerful currents that flow beneath the surface. Marx explains history as the study of classes and their conflicts and therefore as the scientific study of the social relations of production and their transformation. The manifesto begins with a statement on the broad sweep of history. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. Freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight, a fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. This video clip from the Oscar-winning film Harlan County, USA by Barbara Koppel captures one of those moments when the fight is out in the open, a 1972 strike by Kentucky miners against North Carolina-based Duke Power. Addressing a striker's rally, Florence Reese, daughter and wife of coal miners, sings the anthem she had written for an earlier generation. I'm a coal miner, as you well know, but I'm as close as I could be not to be one. My father was a coal miner who was killed in the mines, and my husband is slowly dying with black lung. And my husband and me was in the strike in the 30s in bloody Harlan County, and I do mean it is bloody, too. And they tell me, these miners say, we're going to stick it out unless Duke Power signed the contract till hell freezes over. <laughs> nothing to lose but their chains and their union to gain so I say hang in there and I now this song I composed in the 30s and you know I'm old as 40 years ago and I can't sing very well but you, you can ask the scabs and the gun thugs which side they're on because they're workers too come all you poor workers good news to you I'll tell how the good old union has come in here to dwell. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? If you go to Harlan County, there is no neutral air. You'll either be a union man or a thug for J.H. Blair. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? The collisions between individual workmen and individual bourgeois take more and more the character of collisions between two classes. Thereupon, the workers begin to form combinations, trades unions, against the bourgeois. They club together in order to keep up the rate of wages. The trade union struggle in the workplace over wages and the conditions of labor is the most basic form of the class struggle under capitalism. But, in addition to the workplace, the class struggle is fought in other fields as well. It's fought in the field of relations within families and communities, in the field of relations between nations, in the field of the state as conflicts over class legislative interests, and in the field of ideas. Each of these fields of class struggle is addressed in the manifesto, especially in section 2. Addressing class struggle in the field of ideas Marx writes, When people speak of ideas that revolutionize society, they do but express the fact that within the old society, the elements of a new one have been created, and that the dissolution of the old ideas keeps even pace with the dissolution of the old conditions of existence. 
The selfish misconception that induces you to transform into eternal laws of nature and of reason, the social forms springing from your present mode of production and form of property, historical relations that rise and disappear in the progress of production, this misconception you share with every ruling class that has preceded you. What you see clearly in the case of ancient property, what you admit in the case of feudal property, you are of course forbidden to admit in the case of your own bourgeois form of property. The word you in this passage refers to the bourgeoisie. Concealment of the social nature of humankind, concealment of the class nature of history, and deception regarding class identity have been fundamental tools of bourgeois politics throughout the age of capitalism. Marxists call this sort of false consciousness ideology. Once we understand the class nature of history and of ideology, we have the foundation for a consistent and effective working class politics. This is why the manifesto begins by putting forward a clear perspective on history. To see how a clear understanding of classes and class struggle can be effective in analyzing current events, let's take a look at a speech by filmmaker Michael Moore during the series of massive protests at the Wisconsin State House in March 2011. He analyzes the economic crisis of 2008 and how it was used by the financial bourgeoisie to improve their position and to weaken the working class. Two elements of Moore's analysis are especially important. Early in his speech, he points out that the mainstream media conceals the extent of the sheer economic clout and the tiny size of the American capitalist class. Later in his speech, he points out that bourgeois politicians routinely deceive workers into supporting them by promoting the idea that you too might be rich someday. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In Wisconsin, the standoff over Governor Scott Walker's budget repair bill continues. The proposed legislation would eliminate or limit the collective bargaining rights for the majority of public sector workers across the state. On Friday, Walker ordered the arrest of the 14 Democratic state senators who left the state in order to deny Republicans quorum for the vote. According to state law, 20 senators must be present to pass any budget bill, and the Republicans hold only, hold only 19 seats. Also on Friday, Walker sent out notices to unions of impending layoffs if the bill isn't passed in the two next weeks. State workers and their supporters have been rallying in unprecedented numbers in Madison over the last few weeks. Tens of thousands of teachers, firemen, police officers, students, and families have taken to the streets and to the halls of the state capitol to demonstrate their opposition to the bill. On Saturday, thousands of people rallied again on the steps of the state capitol. Among those who took the microphone was Academy Award-winning filmmaker Michael Moore. America is not broke. Contrary to what those in power would like you to believe, so that you'll give up your pension, cut your wages, and settle for the life your great-grandparents had, America is not broke. Not by a long shot. The country is awash in wealth and cash. It's just that it's not in your hands. It has been transferred in the greatest heist in history from the workers and consumers to the banks and the portfolios of the uber rich. Right now, this afternoon, just 400 Americans, 400, have more wealth than half of all Americans combined. Let me say that again. And please, someone in the mainstream media, just repeat this fact once. just once. 400 obscenely wealthy individuals, 400 little Mubariks, most of whom benefited in some way from the multi-trillion dollar taxpayer bailout of 2008, now have more cash, stock, 
and property than the assets of 155 million Americans combined. It is a shame. If you can't bring yourself to call that a financial coup d'etat, then you are simply not being honest with what you know in your heart to be true. But I can see why people don't want to even think about this. For us to admit that we have let a small group of men abscond with and hoard the bulk of the wealth that runs our economy would mean that we'd have to accept the humiliating acknowledgement that we have indeed surrendered our precious democracy to the moneyed elite. Wall Street, the banks, and the Fortune 500 now run this republic. And until this past month, here in Madison, Wisconsin, the rest of us, until then, have felt completely helpless, unable to find a way to do anything about it. Now, just like your soon-to-be ex-governor, than a high school education. But, Governor Walker, back when I was in school, every student had to take one semester of economics in order to graduate. And here's what I learned. Money doesn't grow on trees. It's a palm tree. <laughs> it grows when we make things. It grows when we have good jobs with good wages that we use to buy the things we need. And guess what? That creates more jobs. It grows when we provide an outstanding educational system. An educational system that then grows a new generation of inventors, entrepreneurs, artists, scientists, thinkers, the people who will come up with the next great idea for this planet. And those ideas create jobs. share of the taxes. They'd rather invest it in a gambling casino in a gambling casino known as Wall Street, betting for or against the stock market or against your home mortgage. And the entire population suffers because that wealth has been removed from circulation. What's so cynical about this is that the very people who don't pay their taxes, crash our economic system. They created the unemployment, which has caused less tax revenue. And states like Wisconsin have ended up with a so-called budget crisis. But Wisconsin is not broke. Let's repeat them. Number one, Wisconsin is broke. Number two, there's weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And number three, the Packers need farm in order to win the Super Bowl. The nation, the nation is not. There's lots of money to go 
well that sits on their well-guarded estates. They know, they know that they have committed crimes to make this happen. And they know, and they know that someday you may want to see some of that money that used to be yours. So, so they have bought and paid for hundreds of politicians across the country to do their bidding for them. But just in case that doesn't work, they've got their gated communities. They've got their luxury jet that's always fully fueled, the engines running, waiting for that day, waiting for that day that they hope never comes. To help prevent that day when people, the people, demand their country back, the wealthy have done two very smart things. Number one, they control the message. By owning the media, they have expertly convinced many Americans of few means to buy their version of the American dream and vote for their politicians. Their version of the dream says that you too might be rich someday. This is America, where anything can happen if you just apply yourself. They have conveniently provided you with believable examples to show you how a poor boy can become a rich man. How a, how a guy, <clears throat> how the child of a single mother in Hawaii can become president of the United States and how a guy with a high school education can become a successful filmmaker. <laughs> they, don't fall for it, they will play these stories for you over and over and over again all day long so that the last thing you'll want to do is upset the apple cart. Because yes, you, you, you too might be rich, president, Oscar winner someday. <laughs> the message though is clear. Keep your head down. Keep your nose to the grindstone. Don't rock the boat. Be sure to vote for the party that protects the rich man that you might be someday. And here's the second smart thing the wealthy have done. They've created a poison pill that they know you will never want to take. It's their version of mutually assured destruction. And when they threatened to release this weapon of mass economic annihilation in September of 2008, we blinked as the economy and the stock market went into a tailspin and the banks were caught conducting a worldwide Ponzi scheme. Wall Street issued this threat. Either hand over trillions of dollars from the American taxpayers or we will crash this economy straight into the ground. Crash it straight into the ground. There's a word for that, isn't there? Terrorism. It's a form of terrorism, isn't it? Fork it over or it's goodbye savings accounts. Fork it over or it's goodbye pensions. Fork it over or it's goodbye Fork it over, or it's goodbye jobs and homes and future. Michael Moore in Madison, Wisconsin. For his whole speech, you can go to our website at democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us. The matter of economic crisis that Michael Moore raises brings us to our next topic. Let's recall Sir Francis Bacon's aphorism. Human knowledge and human power meet in one, for where the cause is not known, the effect cannot be produced. Nature to be commanded must be obeyed, and that which in contemplation is as the cause is in operation as the rule. In our survey of the manifesto so far, we have only seen the basic elements of the nature of history. 
the different classes and how they struggle with each other over the distribution of economic surplus and the balance of political power within a given social system. In order to understand how relations of production are transformed from their arrangement in one system into another, that is, in order to understand why revolutions happen, Marx delves deeper into the laws of motion of history. After all, as Bacon says, that which in contemplation is as the cause is an operation as the rule. The development of human productive forces is the key to the laws of motion of history. Increasing productive forces propel historic motion. The Communist Manifesto has three analyses of developing productive forces, divided into three overlapping phases. The rise of the bourgeois class in feudal society, the characteristics of capitalist development, and the periodic economic crises which, like contractions during childbirth, are the signs of a new society struggling to emerge. The rise of the bourgeoisie from the 1200s through the 1700s is the history of how forces of production and exchange that were developed during the feudal era smashed the power of the monarchy and nobility, propelled the revolutionary bourgeoisie into political power, and continued to drive the global expansion of capitalism. From the serfs of the Middle Ages sprang the chartered burghers of the earliest towns. From these burgesses, the first elements of the bourgeoisie were developed. This period includes the establishment in 1397 of the Medici family bank in Florence, Italy. The discovery of America, the rounding of the Cape, opened up fresh ground for the rising bourgeoisie. The East Indian and Chinese markets, the colonization of America, trade with the colonies, the increase in the means of exchange and in commodities generally, gave to commerce, to navigation, to industry, an impulse never before known, and thereby to the revolutionary element in the tottering feudal society, a rapid development. This period includes the establishment in 1602 of the Dutch East India Company with the related Amsterdam Stock Exchange. The Dutch East India Company took possession of Indonesia in the name of its shareholders. The feudal system of industry in which industrial production was monopolized by closed guilds now no longer sufficed for the growing wants of the new markets. The manufacturing system took its place. The guild masters were pushed on one side by the manufacturing middle class. Division of labor between the different corporate guilds vanished in the face of division of labor in each single workshop. Meantime, the markets kept ever growing, the demand ever rising, even manufacture no longer sufficed. Thereupon, steam and machinery revolutionized industrial production. The place of manufacture was taken by the giant modern industry, the place of the industrial middle class by industrial millionaires, the leaders of the whole industrial armies, the modern bourgeois. This is the period of the Industrial Revolution, which, by harnessing labor to scientific principles, created unparalleled productivity. Each step in the development of the bourgeoisie was accompanied by a corresponding political advance of that class an oppressed class under the sway of the feudal nobility, an armed and self-governing association in the medieval commune, here independent urban republic, as in Italy and Germany, there taxable third estate of the monarchy, as in France, afterwards, in the period of manufacturing proper, serving either the semi-feudal or the absolute monarchy as a counterpoise against the nobility, and, in fact, cornerstone of the great monarchies in general, the bourgeoisie, has at last, since the establishment of modern industry and of the world market, conquered for itself, in the modern representative state, exclusive political sway. The executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. This phase culminates with the French Revolution of 1789, during which masses of people, worker, peasant, bourgeois, even a segment of the nobility, mobilized against a common enemy, the monarchy. During over a decade of revolution, the French bourgeoisie pushed aside the political representatives of the working classes 
and exercised domination of the military and the bureaucracy. The French legal code that promoted bourgeois forms of property, as well as a certain degree of democratic reform, followed Napoleon's armies into other countries of Europe. Phase two is capitalist development. The analysis of this phase begins, the bourgeoisie, historically, has played a most revolutionary part. Marx emphasizes the revolutionary nature of the bourgeoisie as he explains a key characteristic of modern capitalist development. The bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production and thereby the relations of production and with them the whole relations of society. The bourgeoisie makes a wily and resourceful opponent with a good deal of its own revolutionary experience and, on the other hand, its revolutionary nature made it a potential ally in the democratic transformation of those societies that were still under feudal domination at the time. We continue our discussion of this phase with a segment of Jesse Drew's award-winning 1995 work, Manifestoon, where he illustrates the words of the Communist Manifesto with cartoon images. The bourgeoisie has stripped of its halo every occupation hitherto honored and looked up to with reverent awe. It has converted the physician, the lawyer, the priest, the poet, the scientist into its paid wage laborers. It has left no other bond between people than naked self-interest, than callous cash payment. It has resolved personal worth into exchange value, and in place of the numberless indefeasible chartered freedoms, has set up that single unconscionable freedom, free trade. In one word, for exploitation, failed by religious and political illusions, it has substituted naked, shameless, direct, brutal exploitation. By freedom is meant, under the present bourgeois conditions, of production, free trade, free selling, and buying. The need of a constantly expanding market for its products chases the bourgeoisie over the whole surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. All old established national industries have been destroyed or are daily being destroyed. They are dislodged by new industries whose introduction becomes a life and death question for all civilized nations. By industries that no longer work up indigenous raw material, but raw material drawn from the remotest zones. Industries whose products are consumed, not only at home, but in every corner of the globe. In place of the old wants, satisfied by the production of the country, we find new wants, requiring for their satisfaction the products of distant lands and climes. It compels all nations on pain of extinction to adopt the bourgeois mode of production. It compels them to introduce what it calls civilization into their midst i.e. to become bourgeois themselves. In a word, it creates a world after its own image. The third analysis of productive forces focuses on the rise, under capitalism, of widespread, coordinated industrial labor, or what Marx refers to as social labor. Social labor is such a powerful productive force that the framework of bourgeois society is too narrow to handle the volume of commodities it is able to produce. This results, paradoxically, in periodic economic depressions that threaten the basis of bourgeois property. Although the Communist Manifesto was written relatively early in the history of capitalism, its description of the periodic economic crises of capitalism remains one of the book's most vivid and penetrating insights. It has agglomerated population, centralized the means of production, and has concentrated property in a few hands. Subjection of nature's forces to man, machinery, application of chemistry to industry and agriculture, steam navigation, railways, electric telegraphs, clearing of whole continents for cultivation, canalization of rivers. What earlier century had even a presentiment that such productive forces slumbered in the lap of social labor? 
Modern bourgeois society with its relations of production, of exchange, and of property, a society that has conjured up such gigantic means of production and of exchange, is like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he has called up by his spells. In these crises there breaks out an epidemic that in all earlier epochs would have seemed an absurdity, the epidemic of overproduction. And how does the bourgeois get over these crises? On the one hand, by enforced destruction of a mass of productive forces. On the other, by the conquest of new markets and by the more thorough exploitation of the old ones. Crises of overproduction are times when the bourgeois class is economically weak. The historical pattern that emerged since the time of Marx and Engels is that during these crises, bourgeois politicians conjure up scapegoats and imagined threats in order to draw attention away from the real threats posed to bourgeois property by the gigantic social forces of production and exchange that the bourgeoisie itself called into being. The militarist populism they encourage divides working people and creates unfounded fears. The bourgeoisie uses this political atmosphere to weaken the working class and to resolve the economic crises in its favor. In the Great Depression of the late 1920s and early 1930s, Hitler conjured up the threat of communists, Jews, and other so-called inferior races. In today's economic crises, the political scapegoats are Islam, migrant workers, and public employee unions. The periodic crises of capitalism swell the ranks of those workers experiencing the misery of unemployment. And here it becomes evident that the bourgeoisie is unfit any longer to be the ruling class in society and to impose its conditions of existence upon society as an overriding law. World War I was the culmination of a complex crisis that engulfed European capitalism in the early 1900s. In the aftermath of that war, the Russian working class succeeded where first Napoleon's armies and then the battering ram of free trade failed. They toppled the monarchy and created the first socialist state, the Soviet Union. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels were active as radical Democrats in their native Germany. An intolerable political situation emerged there and the two left. Engels went to England and Marx to France. They met in Paris in 1844 and began a lifelong collaboration. The Communist Manifesto was authored by Karl Marx early in 1848 based on drafts that Frederick Engels, consulting with working class radicals in London, wrote late in 1847. It was composed in the midst of ferment during the advancing Industrial Revolution and published weeks before the uprisings of 1848 swept across Western Europe. Since that time, the manifesto has come to be regarded as a fundamental text of politics and social science. To understand this text, it's important to understand something of its historical context. The mines and mills of the advancing Industrial Revolution were powered by steam engines. Manufactured goods from Britain, the workshop of the world, dominated global trade. What was on people's minds in the 1840s? The paintings of Joseph Turner juxtaposed images of human history with the great forces of nature. In a period when developments in science began to grasp these forces of nature, Turner's juxtapositions with human history were provocative. Under dreadful conditions, workers in the British textile mills wove cotton that was grown by enslaved African workers on large-scale plantations in the United States which, in turn, were built on land from which the indigenous inhabitants had been forcibly removed. The textile mills of Manchester 
connected to the port of Liverpool by railway, produced not only fabrics for the world market, but also an army of proletarians. Frederick Engels arrived in Manchester in December 1842. He soon began a relationship with Mary Burns that endured until her death 20 years later. Mary Burns was a radical mill worker who introduced him to the life of Manchester's working class. Engels' passionate and systematic observations on the economy and urban life of the growing industrial city were published in 1844. A 22-year-old German sent to Manchester to work in a branch of his father's textile company. He witnesses at first hand the ugly face of unchecked capitalism. If anyone wishes to see in how little space a human being can move, how little air and such air he can breathe, it is only necessary to travel hither. This is Friedrich Engels. Everywhere, heaps of debris, refuse and offal, standing pools for gutters, and a stench which alone would make it impossible for a human being in any degree civilized to live in such a district. Often more than one family lives in a single damp cellar in whose pestilent atmosphere 12 to 16 persons are crowded together. This is the Altstadt from Manchester, and when I'm and upon rereading my account, I have to admit that it is not exaggerated, but not even dark enough to convey the true sense of grit, ruin, and uninhabitableness of this district with its 20 to 30,000 inhabitants. Great working class movements had emerged by that time. In Britain, the center of the Industrial Revolution, the working class mobilized behind the Chartists, and in France, behind the Democratic clubs. This is a photograph of the Chartist mass meeting of 1848 in London. The name of the Chartist movement came from a document called the People's Charter, which listed several democratic demands that galvanized the working class. The main demand was universal manhood suffrage. The Chartists organized many protests and collected millions of signatures on the People's Charter. In 1845, the abolitionist leader Frederick Douglass published his autobiography and left for Europe, where he spent two years mobilizing anti-slavery solidarity in Ireland and England. He helped leading Chartists establish the Anti-Slavery League. Frederick Engels was also drawn to the Chartists. As soon as he came to England, he contacted George Harney, trade unionist and editor of the leading Chartist newspaper, The Northern Star, which had achieved an astonishingly large circulation. Engels contributed articles to The Northern Star, and Harney became a lifelong supporter of Marx and Engels. This is an illustration of a mass demonstration organized by the Parisian Democratic Clubs in 1848 as they struggled against French capitalists who were trying to reverse political gains by working class forces. The leading newspaper of this movement was called La Reforme, to which Marx and Engels both contributed articles. The more resolute among the leaders of the mass working class movement began to come together in groups to share ideas and to organize. One such group was called the League of the Just. As the organization grew, it shed its former conspiratorial character, held debates on its political outlook, and changed its name. It became the Communist League. Its members felt the need to publicize their views, and Marx and Engels were asked to draft a pamphlet that described its outlook. That pamphlet was the Communist Manifesto, published in February 1848. The Manifesto was certainly not the first tract on socialist or communist ideas but the earlier writings often focused on achieving great change through conspiratorial action, on setting up model communities outside of society as a whole, or on seeking salvation from enlightened members of the ruling class. The earlier writings did not have a scientific viewpoint on history. What made the Communist Manifesto a landmark was its explanation of how changes in the forces of production lay the basis for dramatic transformations in society through the historic action of masses of people.
The Communist Manifesto was the first fully developed statement of class conscious politics. It was produced within the context of a mass working class and democratic movement that was growing in maturity and influence. Marx describes within the pages of the manifesto itself the evolution of class consciousness as it happened in the history of the European working class. There are two passages on this topic, each dealing with a different qualitative level of class consciousness. In Marx's terminology, the two levels are class in itself and, building on that foundation, class for itself. With only consciousness of the class in itself, the capitalist framework is not called into question. With consciousness of the class for itself, it is. Consciousness of the class for itself comes with understanding the proletariat's independent historic capacity to lead development of the productive forces, the proletariat's capacity to govern, and its unique interest in eliminating the class basis of society. Marx aimed to spell out the consciousness of class for itself in the Communist Manifesto. We'll explore these ideas in more detail and conclude with an excerpt from a remarkable sermon on this topic by Martin Luther King Jr. The development of the first level of class consciousness, class in itself, is explained in section one of the manifesto. The proletariat goes through various stages of development. With its birth begins its struggle with the bourgeoisie. At first the contest is carried on by individual laborers then by the work people of a factory, then by the operative of one trade in one locality against the individual bourgeois who directly exploits them. They direct their attacks not against the bourgeois conditions of production, but against the instruments of production themselves. They destroy imported wares that compete with their labor. They smash to pieces machinery. They set factories ablaze. They seek to restore by force the vanished status of the workmen of the Middle Ages. The growing competition among the bourgeois and the resulting commercial crises make the wages of the workers ever more fluctuating. The increasing improvement of machinery, ever more rapidly developing, makes their livelihood more and more precarious. The collisions between individual workmen and individual bourgeois take more and more the character of collisions between two classes. Thereupon the workers begin to form combinations trades unions against the bourgeois. They club together in order to keep up the rate of wages. They found permanent associations in order to make provision beforehand for these occasional revolts. Here and there the contest breaks out into riots. Now and then the workers are victorious, but only for a time. The real fruit of their battle lies not in the immediate result, but in the ever-expanding union of the workers. Luisa Moreno was an immigrant from Guatemala, and when she came to the United States, she found a job operating a sewing machine in a New York City sweatshop. Radicalized by her experiences, she became a professional labor organizer. Luisa Moreno was a driving force behind the Spanish-speaking People's Congress, the first national Latino civil rights assembly. During the 1930s, she organized workers in South Texas, Colorado, Michigan, and California. Luisa Moreno rose through the ranks of the California Labor Union Movement and became the first Latina to reach elective office at the state level in the Congress of Industrial Union. She was deported to Mexico during the anti-communist McCarthy era of the 1950s. The INS conducted Project Wetback and targeted and deported Mexicans and labor leaders. Luisa Moreno is one of the most accomplished labor leaders in the history of the United States. With a career spanning the Great Depression and World War II, she remains the only transcontinental Latina union organizer. This organization of the proletarians into a class, and consequently into a political party, is continually being upset again by the competition between the workers themselves. But it ever rises up again stronger, firmer, mightier. It compels legislative recognition of particular interests of the workers by taking advantage of the divisions among the bourgeoisie itself. Thus, the Ten Hours Bill in England was carried. The Ten Hours Bill 
or Factory Act of 1847, limited the work week for women and children to 58 hours, 10 hours a day, six days a week, effective May 1, 1848. Marx believed that both political and economic action is essential for the formation of working class consciousness. As the contemporary philosopher Hilary Putnam has argued, human consciousness resides only partly between your ears. There is also a collective aspect to human consciousness which is supported and structured by social institutions such as schools, churches, cultural institutions, unions, and political parties. Interplay between the individual and the collective is evident in Marx's historical description. Working class consciousness becomes a material force when workers form organizations to shape society after their own interests. On the left, representatives of the machinists' union open contract negotiations with management at aircraft manufacturer Boeing. On the right is Ben Davis, communist city councillor from Harlem in the 1940s. In order to govern society, that is, in order to move from being a lobbying force to being the leading force, the working class must face all the issues that society as a whole faces. Working class consciousness matures, therefore, in taking on the struggle against all forms of oppression, racism, sexism, homophobia, and for democracy, in taking on the struggle against war and for international solidarity, and ultimately in taking on the struggle to eliminate the class basis of society. The second passage on working class consciousness is found in section two of the manifesto. Marx writes, we have seen above that the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class, to win the battle of democracy. The proletariat will use its political supremacy to wrest, by degree, all capital from the bourgeoisie, by means of measures which appear economically insufficient and untenable, but which, in the course of the movement, outstrip themselves necessitate further inroads upon the old social order and are unavoidable as a means of entirely revolutionizing the mode of production. These measures will, of course, be different in different countries. Following this passage, there is a list of ten general measures, from establishing a progressive income tax and a publicly owned central bank to free public education. These ideas are illustrated in many ways by the life and works of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. After winning such monumental victories as the Voting Rights Act of 1965, it became clearer that achieving freedom is more than a matter of legal definition. Brutal inequalities were reproduced in the capitalist marketplace. King became increasingly focused on the effects of poverty and war. The audio clip we'll hear is from his presidential address to the 1967 convention of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? There are 40 million poor people here. And one day we must ask the question, why are there 40 million poor people in America? And when you begin to ask that question, you're raising a question about the economic system, about a broader distribution of wealth. When you ask that question, you begin to question the capitalistic economy. And I'm simply saying that more and more, we've got to begin to ask questions about the whole society. We are called upon to help the discouraged beggars in life's marketplace. But one day we must come to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. It means that questions must be raised. You see, my friends, when you deal with this, you begin to ask the question, who owns the oil? You began to ask the question, who owns the iron ore? You began to ask the question, why is it that people have to pay water bills in a world that's two-thirds water? These are words that must be said. Now when I say question in the whole society, it means 
ultimately coming to see that the problem of racism, the problem of economic exploitation, and the problem of war are all tied together. These are the triple evils that are interrelated. And if you will let me be a preacher just a little bit, one day, one night a juror came to Jesus and he wanted to know what he could do to be saved. Jesus didn't get bogged down on the kind of isolated approach of what you shouldn't do. Jesus didn't say, now Nicodemus, you must stop lying. He didn't say, Nicodemus, now you must not commit adultery. He didn't say, now Nicodemus, you must stop cheating if you are doing that. He didn't say, Nicodemus, you must stop drinking liquor if you are doing that excessively. He said something altogether different because Jesus realized something basic. That if a man will lie, he will steal. And if a man will steal, he will kill. So instead of just getting bogged down on one thing, Jesus looked at him and said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. In other words, your whole structure must be changed. A nation that will keep people in slavery for 244 years will thingify them and make them things. And therefore they will exploit them and poor people generally, economically. And a nation that will exploit economically will have to have foreign investments and everything else. And it will have to use its military might to protect them. All of these problems are tied together. What I'm saying today is that we must go from this convention and say, America, you must be born again. Arise, you workers from your slumber. Arise, you prisoners of want. That's right. For reason in revolt now thunder. Chains of hatred, greed, and fear. Away with all your superstitions Serve our masses Arise, arise We'll change henceforth the old tradition And spurn the dust to win the prize So comrades, come on and rally Then the last fight let us face The international unites the whole darn human race So comrades, come on, let's go rally And the last fight, let us face The international unites The whole darn human race No more deluded by reaction On tyrants only we'll make war the soldiers too will take strike action They'll break ranks and fight no more And if those cannibals keep trying To sacrifice us to their pride Each at the forge must do their duty And we'll strike while the iron is hot So comrades, come on, let's go rally And the last fight let us face the international unites the whole beautiful human race. So, comrades, come on, let's go rally. Ha! And the last fight, let us face the international unites the whole.
el asiento me complace más que el mar denle al pano el gobierno que arde y brilla en el cristal a mí denme el poste eterno cuando rompe en el, el sol Guantanamera Guajira Guantanamera Guantanamera Guajira Guantanamera Yo quiero salir del mundo por la puerta natural en un carro de hojas verdes a morir de llevar no me pongan en los muros a morir como un traidor yo soy bueno y como bueno moriré de cara al sol Guantanamera Guajira Guantanamera Guantanamera Guajira Yeah.